Hi, my name is Pete, Pete Hillman. I'm a professor of hematology at Leeds. Um, uh, speaking from the 2017 International Workshop on CLL. I'm joined by two good friends and colleagues, uh, Rick Furman from New York and Stephen Mulligan from, from uh, Sydney. And we're going to discuss the, what's been happening in the meeting to date. So we heard about uh, David Rossi gave a talk about the application really of, of new um, molecular markers that we've really described in the last two or three years mm -hmm. and how they're affecting our treatment strategies. What, what were your thoughts about the, the key parts of his, of his presentation? Right. So I was going to say, the, uh, you know, as long as someone really remains a CLL, I think we have a tremendous number of therapies to offer them, both the, the traditional and the newer ones, and ones that are still yet to come. What I find really so important is to identify those people who really are at risk of developing Richter's transformations, mm -hmm. and really trying to identify what we could do maybe ahead of time to treat those patients differently so that they don't develop a Richter's. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what's been so uh, important about Davida's work is that it really gives us a way to sort of identify, especially when you realize that notch one is often present on day one, mm -hmm. a way to really identify those people ahead of the time. Mm -hmm. And that really could have a major, major impact upon those patients that we aren't able to currently take care of with our, our current tools. Mm. I guess that we, we've, for many years, been using deletion chromosome 17 to define as a therapy, one of the few things that's defined therapy. But, but we, David does obviously a lot of work on the mutation analysis of T53, and, and we talked, he talked about the, the levels that you might yes, achieve. And what's right. your thoughts on you, you want a big well, analysis lab, so. Yeah, so look, I, I think the things that are important are the, obviously the identification of 17P. It's present in about 5% of patients at the time of diagnosis, but particularly those that have been previously treated, uh, it increases to a much higher level. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting that's come out of the meeting, partly uh, with one of the presentations at the Young Investigator meeting, was the difference between uh, 17P de detection and complex carrier type. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's now emerging data suggesting that a complex carrier type, not just more than three, uh, or three or more, but five or more, has got a really quite significant impact on prognosis. Uh, and that's not detectable by four-target fish, mm -hmm. uh, although quite clearly 17p deletion, uh, either detected by fish or other genomic uh, techniques, is very important. Uh, and also the subset of patients that have got a uh, PP, T, TP53 mutation mm -hmm. without necessarily having a deletion. And the mutated patients, are, the PP53 mutated patients, are, are, are an issue, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Because I think we're all, I guess, we're starting to perform that, that assay. And, and, and you know, we've even got drugs now that are approved in that setting. I mean, are you yes. using it routinely? Like, I do, and I think it's a very important, mm -hmm. you know, the thing that I found also very important from uh, David Rossi's talk is the idea that, you know, these patients do have 17P deleted, uh, 17p deletions or mutations in TP53 that are present at levels that we can't detect with our current NGS panels or mm -hmm. our Sanger sequencing. And you know, of course, when we're dealing with a billion billion cells, which mm. is, you know, CLL, unlike all of the malignancies, we watch and wait, and the patients have all this time for, you know, clonal heterogeneity and other disruptions to occur. So. You know, it could be just one or two cells deep, deep, deep down the tumor that we'll never detect. And I think what really we need to figure out is whether or not, you know, obviously by using chemotherapy that doesn't select for P53, by avoiding chemotherapy and using the novel agents, you know, whether or not we really can have the impact on not basically creating 17P deleted cases later on. So at diagnosis, it's about 3 to 5%. You know, when you look at the ibrutinib and idelis of pivotal studies, it was 35 to 45 percent. Yes. Mm -hmm. But they were in relapsed refractory Right, yes, that's right. right. And the, so the key is, by avoiding chemotherapy, maybe we'll avoid creating all these 17 mm -hmm. p deleted cases, which I think really would have a major impact long term on the longevity of CLL patients. I think, I think the, the big, one of the big debates in the questions related to David, with David's talk was the what's the cutoff that, that we should be using clinically? Because yes. I think there's challenges. Mm. I mean, we've done, we've published data going down to 0.3 percent, but, but, you know, routine labs, you're going to start getting false positives and, 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 and if you're making treatment decisions. I, I think the discussion seemed to be revolved around, well, 5 or 10 percent, you know, except that is abnormal, but, yes. but, but if it's 
But other I, than that, see it. But I really think what you know was being focused on is it doesn't matter mm -hmm. that. You know, there's certainly going to be a risk of having a false positive, mm -hmm. and a false positive is a false positive. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the key thing is, is that, you know, if it's present at 0.1% and it's a true 0.1% positivity, you know, you treat it wrong and it will become, you know, that surviving, um, it will be that clone that survives think, and think, repopulates. I think, I think you're right, but, uh, you know, in, in principle, but the data we have, I mean, the data we have from a series of FCR-based treatments is if we're going down to 5%, then, yeah, that's subclonal populations that at that level. But, but that's based on response and PFS. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea is that, you know, if you have 0.1% 17P deleted mm -hmm. and you treat with FCR, you have to grow back from that 0.1% all the way back to a clinically relevant clone. If you have a 30% 17P deletion, it's going to be, you know, 30 divided mm -hmm. by 0.1% larger clone and exponentially that much quicker. Mm -hmm. So I think the key is recognizing that, you know, the FCR data is response and PFS, which is going to be dependent upon the size of the clone. Mm -hmm. But if the clone's there and you're treating with chemotherapy, which, you know, is not going to be able to address the clone, it will emerge. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, I think now that we have these other options, you know, that's going to be the key part is to avoid enabling that that clone, or repopulating with that clone. I, mean, I think they're worrying about, they're worried about karyotyping, and you mentioned the karyotyping, yes. and there was, there was some nice data in the Young Investigators meeting, as you said, yes. is, is standardization of that technique is, you know, th there isn't a standardized a technique that would, that everyone's going to be using the same technique, and we're starting to try to look at that, because it's very recent, and uh, the, the technique, one would hope that we would end up with a genomic, because yes. karyotyping is such a difficult, uh, uh, well, tested. it's labor intensive. Yeah, yes, so it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge, I think. Mm. And there are some places out there where you can get karyotyping done, mm -hmm. and it is important to recognize that if it's not done in the way that really is prescribed, that mm -hmm. it really is going to give you false information. Yeah, that's right. And then we talked, we heard about the, gui the new guidelines. Well, we, well we, we'll briefly talk about them. I think we need to change the guidelines. We, we, but the, it's a painful experience trying to do that, and and uh, and, and the, a lot of it's opinion, but it's about standardising treatments, I think. So well, standardising response assessments is the most important thing from my perspective. But it changes so quickly, doesn't it, that you can't, you know, what we do this year, next year, we have a new drug that does something slightly differently. So. Yes, to some extent, particularly with re regard to the response assessment, mm -hmm. and I think particularly in this current era mm -hmm. of B cell receptor antagonists that increase the lymphocytosis, I think, mm -hmm and that can last from uh, anywhere from the beginning of uh, treatment mm -hmm. out to three or even four years. Mm -hmm. uh, and defining an end point for that I think is uh, mm -hmm. quite important and what you use as that end point. There was a lot of, there was a lot of discussion wasn't there yeah. about, uh, about you know, what, what's really high risk disease and what, what patients would you recommend after failing chemotherapy mm. to not to be retreated with chemotherapy. Well, in my practice I've not used chemotherapy in relapsed disease for probably four years because we've had trials yes. of yes. targeted treatment. I mean, yeah. it's difficult to recommend retreating someone if they've had two and a half year, year remission. You know, it's hard for the guidelines to really make any recommendations on treatment mm. because of, Absolutely. you know, the variability yeah. country to country. Yes. And I think exactly. that that's sort of a, uh, you know, and, you know, some locations or some nations that aren't as able to have as much mm. choice in their, their decisions. Yes. One of the things I do think that's, um, you know, very salient about the, the criteria though, when you do talk about the lymphocytosis, it's important to remember that the lymphocytosis, we have good data from investigators showing that that lymphocytosis is full of cells that are often inhibited mm -hmm. and that it doesn't mm -hmm. change with prognosis. Mm -hmm. um, what we really need to do is identify what are the, you know, prognostic markers are very, you know, situation dependent. And mm -hmm. so with, you know, ibrutinib, you're going to have different prognostic markers than you would have with F FCR chemotherapy, or it might not be. but mm -hmm. You know, so the emerging data on the interface fish as a predictive outcome, you know, those are the patients who we might worry about taking time. Mm -hmm. And what we really need to do is to sort of identify, you know, if a person with 17P hasn't reached a certain level of depletion by some time, they're going to be at risk of progressing. Whereas for a 13Q deleted patient, that may never actually happen, that sure. they yes might be able to go for years and years and years without mm. having that secondary hit occur. Mm. And so that becomes very important. Mm. Mm. And, so, and, uh, and we're, gonna, we're talking this afternoon about uh, really minimal res residual disease eradication, which of course in the chemotherapy eras 
been a very important prognostic marker because we haven't really used it to define duration of therapy. But one of the big challenges I think we've got now is the duration of therapy with some of these agents, especially when patients are, mm. are achieving, you know, really very good clinical remissions and deep molecular remissions um, and flow remissions. And what, what, what's your view on MRD? Do you think MRD is going to become less and more important over the next, you know, two three years? Well, I think there's still going to be a proportion of patients that get treated with uh, chemoimmunotherapy, mm -hmm. depending on the environment yeah. and poten potentially their mutational mm -hmm. status. Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly, it's extremely important in those patients. Mm -hmm. uh, it may well become important with venetoclax. Uh, I think the data is not really through enough for that to make an assessment. Uh, but for the B cell receptor antagonist, I think it's really a bit open at the moment. Mm -hmm. mm. I mean, you've got a lot of experience with the, with, uh, the various um, BCRIs and and so I really have to emphasize, you know, for the BCR antagonists, you know, PFS is really the single most important per marker. I mean, being MRD negative is always preferable, mm -hmm. but the $64,000 question is going to be whether or not adding an additional therapy with additional toxicities to achieve MRD really has a clinical advantage. Mm -hmm. And so until we prove that, mm -hmm. you know, MRD really doesn't have a role to play with these new agents. Mm -hmm. Now with venetoclax, it's a very different question. And we're really starting to talk about discontinuation of therapies mm -hmm. at some point, you know, both venetoclax and the, um, like the use of ibrutinib in the FLARE trial that you're leading in mm -hmm. the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So it'd be very interesting to identify whether or not 10 to the minus four is really gonna be our limit of detection or whether or not we will really get beyond that and how are you using that information in the FLARE trial? Yes, I think, I think for, that's, well, so first of all, regarding using MRD, I, I use MRD in, a tri in our trials and, and clinically to understand the dynamic of response. So one of the challenges with Ibrutinib, for example, is that once you get a normal lymphocyte count, you don't know if the, you've still got three logs of disease you can, you, that mm. can be going down. And, and actually, we've got patients who've got the same lymphocyte count and the disease is stable or starting to relapse, and others where they continue to go into remission. So it, it, I find it helpful, not as a positive or negative, but just as a, a, an accurate quantitative quantification of the disease. Mm. In terms of modeling the disease, and, and I think our aim, I'm sure everyone's aim is to get to a, a sort of non-toxic, potentially curative, or at least a functionally cure, where you've got a long period of treatment. Um, for patients without causing the problems we see with chemotherapy. And I think with venetoclax, and the venetoclax particularly with combinations with ambrutinib, which we're, we're presenting at this meeting, and then with venetuzumab also in the mix, uh, we're getting significant proportions of patients to MRD negative remissions. And so we're trying to model what level, how long would you have to treat someone after MRD negativity before you stop treatment? and and can expect a very durable remission. And uh, from modeling, it's sort of uh, probably two or three logs lower than we can measure. I mean, it's down to 10 to the minus eight, probably. Mm. And so we, we, we've been using the FLIR trial, which is our frontline study, which has ibrutinib and ibrutinib venetoclax now, now in it, to, to look at the, the speed of response. And then when the patient's negative, to, to extrapolate a continued response to, to the point where we think we've got to lower level of disease. So the easiest way to do that, and the way we're, we're doing it, is by treating the patient for the same duration again as it took them to get to negativity. Is that, so does your model actually indicate that the time to MRD negativity is the time that it takes to get that, or, are you doing, or is that chosen to be sort of on the safe side? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly on the, on the safer side, and, and, but it's also easier to, it's an easy way to do it because if you try and work out the, the rate of decline, you, re, you require several different readings. And if you don't have those readings, you can't measure it. Whereas you know when the patient becomes negative. So it's easy to do. It's probably lower than we actually think we need to go, but, but we'd rather be on the safe side than on the, you know, the, the not. Because you can't measure the, the bit below the line. So you can't measure whether the patient is plateauing out. Mm. There's no real rationale or the reason that they should suddenly go to wake detect and then stop responding. I mean, they, they should continue to respond. And, and the trial will, will, test, will test that. Mm. Is there anything else that you've seen today that's, that's, that you think is controversial or interesting? Well, the other thing I found really interesting was the discussion on the uh, stereotypical subsets and really, mm. yeah. you know, uh, how profoundly prognostic they are. Mm. And it really, one, is nice because it fits with the biology. And we're now beginning to understand a lot more about the antigen 
that mm. these antibodies are binding to. And even, you know, what was, I thought the most interesting aspect was that some of these aren't even direct, um, you know, complement determining region binding mm -hmm. of an antigen, but an antigen that might be binding to another part of the antibody. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what it's binding, binding to itself. Right. Right. Metallic yeah. ears yeah. data was really compelling, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. And that's really, I think, you know, an amazing thing to recognize. And, mm -hmm. you know, once we're able to make these prognostications, we really can sort of guide therapy so that mm -hmm. we don't over-treat patients and we don't under-treat patients. Yeah, I think it was, we're certainly getting to the understanding with the, with the biology of response to biology of disease that, that helps us mod modify treatments and combine logical treatments logically. And I think one of the, the sort of, I mean, obviously the, the new therapies have been a, a huge change in CLL, but also our understanding of the biology of the disease and the, and, and the treatment has, has really allowed, is allowing us to optimize the, the outcomes. And I guess with the new therapies, we, we really should be aiming for, for durable remissions and off treatment and cure. And I think that's really a very important thing to consider. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of physicians talk about using chemotherapy first, and even in the patients who are mutated in immunoglobulin gene. Mm -hmm. And whereas 60% of those IGVH mutated patients will be free from progression at 10 years, you're really dealing with a situation where 40% have progressed. Mm -hmm. And we know that once you progress after FCR, life expectancy is often not that long. And two, you know, the question is, is now that we have patients living out to 10 years, and we have all these other agents that can salvage them or rescue them after a relapse, you know, should we be thinking about what's their marrow function going to be like 20, 30 years down the road? So that 50-year-old who's now 60, you know, it'd be nice to make sure they make it to 70. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important strategy in choosing maybe to put these novel agents first and hold the chemotherapy back. But also more importantly, you know, as we talked about the selection for 17P deletion with the, the use of chemotherapy, you know, since the 17P deleted patients are the ones who really enjoy or who don't enjoy a better outcome with the BCR antagonists, mm -hmm. it's nice to sort of do what we can to avoid selecting for that. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, what seems to be the major end effect of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a great, great way to finish, the, finish our discussion, really, that you're, it's a very optimistic note that we're, we're yes. thinking not you know, can we cure patients, but what's the, what are they going to be like in 10 or 20 years' time, and can we stop, can we prevent uh, them having long-term problems, which I think for any, any oncology specialty is a great place to finish.